Hi, my name is Denise John. I'm faculty at Kellogg Eye Center, University of Michigan. And today I'm going to be talking to you about small pupil cataract surgery. So the goal of this uh, lecture is to define what a small pupil is and how it affects the critical steps in cataract surgery. Uh, describe some causes of a small pupil, uh, preoperative medications that can be used, different intraoperative techniques to help expand the pupil, billing considerations, and then what to say to the patient. So we'll start with the pretest. First question, a small pupil can increase the risk of complications during the following steps of cataract surgery. A, irrigation and aspiration. B, hydrodissection. C, phacal emulsification. D, capsorexis. E, both B and D, and F, all the above. Question two, a small pupil can be caused by the following conditions. A, pseudoexfoliation syndrome. B, pigmentary dispersion syndrome. C, surgery. D, chronic midriatic use. E, both A and C, and F, all the above. So a small pupil technically is defined as a pupil less than four millimeters, but really any size pupil where you can't see enough to do the surgery safely can be considered a small pupil. So a small pupil affects various stages of cataract surgery. The first step it affects would be your capsorexis. We often use the size of the pupil as a guide to constructing the capsorexis. So if you have a small pupil, the capsorexis tends to be very small, and this can lead to difficulties in irrigation and aspiration when trying to remove the subincisional cortical material. The other step it can affect would be hydrodissection. With a small pupil, it makes seeing the uh, fluid wave uh, more difficult. Phacal emulsification can also be affected as far as being able to see the nuclear fragments to remove them during the phacal step. During INA, as I indicated earlier, if the pupil is too small, it makes removing the subcortical uh, material very difficult. And lastly, um, inserting the intraocular lens. So there are various causes for a small pupil. Uh, the first includes a fibrotic pupillary sphincter, and there are different etiologies that fall under this category. The first would be pseudoexfoliation syndrome, which typically on clinical exam looks like uh, kind of dandruff-like material, which you can see in this photograph here. This kind of whitish uh, dandruff fluffy material is the pseudoexfoliation material. Also, when the pupil is dilated, you can see a almost like a target appearance on the um, lens capsule where the iris tissue rubs against the lens. In glaucoma patients who may be on chronic meiotic use, uh, the pupil may be scarred uh, into a smaller position. And then in cases of rubiosis, which can occur in any type of ischemic condition or under inflammation, oftentimes the pupil will not dilate very well. Posterior sneakier essentially is when the iris tissue is adherent to the lens, and this occurs in any case where inflammation occurs in the eye. So it could be from trauma, uh, from surgery, or just from inflammation in itself. Other causes for a small pupil include an older age. In general, older people do not dilate as well. Uh, Ectropion uvae, where the pigmented layer of the iris tissue has migrated onto the anterior surface of the iris, and as a result, the pupil just does not dilate very well. And also in diabetic patients, in general, they do not dilate very well either. The last major category would be alpha-1 antagonists. And these are medications uh, a lot of times that are used for blood pressure control or patients who have um, prostate issues. If you review their medication history, it's really important to see if any of these medications are on the list. Um, even if it may not be on the list, it's also important to ask them if they've ever been on these medications in the past because, for example, with Flomax, even just a brief episode of using that medication in the past can still have a lasting effect on the pupil. Preoperative medications. First question, the following medications prevent meiosis during surgery. A, flurbiprofen, B, tamsulosin, C, preservative-free epinephrine, D, moxifloxacin, E, both A and C, and F, all the above. So the routine dilated medications are going to vary depending on the physician, but in general, we typically start with a midriatic, such as 2.5% venlafrin, and a cycloplegic agent, such as tripicamide, which comes in both 0.5% as well as 1%. Other preoperative medications that can be considered include 
10% phenylephrine, uh, which you may want to use if the patient doesn't dilate very well, but you want to make sure that their blood pressure is well controlled because 10% phenylephrine can cause an elevation in blood pressure. Medications such as cyclopentylate or atropine can sometimes be used uh, several days before the patients undergo cataract surgery to see if that can help dilate the pupil. And lastly, fluorobuprofen is a non anti-inflammatory that can be used to prevent meiosis during cataract surgery. We're going to move on to intraoperative pupil expansion techniques. Question number one. The following technique can be employed to increase the size of the pupil during surgery. A, iris hooks. B, mechanical stretch with a Kuglin hook. C, myeluga ring. D, pupil expansion with provis. And E, all the above. So the first mechanism to start with would be sneaky lysis. So this is typically done in cases of posterior sneaky. Again, just to review, that's when the iris tissue is adherent to the lens. So there are two different ways that this can be managed. One would be using uh, viscoelastic dissection. So essentially, you're taking your viscoelastic cannula and you're finding an area where the iris tissue is not adherent to the lens. And you stick the cannula underneath the iris tissue and then you inject. And the viscoelastic helps to um, pull off the iris tissue from the anterior lens. The other option is a cyclodialysis spatula, where again, you're going in underneath the iris tissue and you are physically removing that adhesion. Other mechanisms include either using a collar button or a Kuglin hook. And in both of these cases, what you're doing is you're stretching the pupil. Um, again, kind of finding an area where the iris tissue is not adherent to the lens and you mechanically stretch the pupil to break the adhesions. Another way to increase the size of the pupil during surgery is using medications. So the first one would be preservative-free epinephrine, which is typically put in the BSS ball during cataract surgery to help to maintain pupil dilation. The other agent would be viscoelastic. Using like a higher molecular weight med, uh, viscoelastic such as ProVisc, this can help to keep the pupil dilated uh, during surgery. Now we're going to move on to pupil stretch. Again, this is typically used in cases with posterior sneakyae or in cases of fibrotic pupils. One thing to keep in mind, if you do do pupil stretch in fibrotic pupils, it's not unusual to see some bleeding occur. And again, that's just because of the scar tissue that's uh, present on the pupillary sphincter. However, you don't want to use pupil stretch in cases of floppy iris because that's just going to make the floppy iris more pronounced and it's going to complicate the surgery even more. Also, you tend not to want to do it in a shallow anterior chamber because there's a risk that the instruments may hit the cornea and cause some endothelial dysfunction. Iris hooks can be used to help dilate the pupil. Again, this, the indications for iris hooks include a shallow anterior chamber, or if you know in advance that you may possibly need to convert from phaco to extra cap cataract surgery, iris hooks can be very beneficial. However, you don't want to use them in cases of a narrow palpebral fissure because the iris hooks themselves can get in the way and sometimes it's very difficult to place because of a limited space. We have the Mylugan ring, uh, which is very popular nowadays. It comes in both a 6.2 as well as a 7 millimeter size. And essentially, it's a ring device that helps to dilate the pupil. And its major indications include floppy iris and in cases of a narrow palpebral fissure. However, you don't want to use it in cases where you're going to be using other types of intraocular hardware or in cases where you need to convert to extra cap cataract extraction. Other pupil expansion techniques, uh, which tend not to be used as much anymore, include removing a portion of the iris tissue. So the first option would be a sphincterotomy, where essentially you're creating small cuts in the pupillary border to help physically enlarge the pupil. And then the other would be doing a sector iridectomy, where essentially you take a piece of the iris tissue and again, this helps to enlarge the size of the pupil. Obviously, ideally, these uh, techniques are kind of more of a last resort because these will physically affect the appearance of the pupil afterwards. Another question. Which medication is commonly associated with intraoperative floppy iris syndrome? A, terazosin, B, doxazosin, C, prazosin, or D, tamsulosin? Talking briefly about intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, also known as IFIS, it's typically associated with tamsulosin, also known as Flomax, which is a very common medication that people are put on for prostate issues. 
Uh, this medication is an alpha-1 antagonist, um, and it leads to issues with small pupil developing during surgery. Typically, it tends to happen during the stages of phaco emulsification, where you insert the phaco, and suddenly the pupil will s shrink, and the floppy iris uh, will want to go to the wound and um, come out of the wound as well. So typical management includes the mylugan ring or the use of epi sugarcane. Uh, epi sugarcane is a combination of preservative-free epinephrine, uh, lidocaine, and BSS. So you get a combination of maintaining pupil dilation as well as anesthesia as well. Changing gears, going to talk a little bit about billing the small pupil. So routine cataract surgery has a CPT code of 66984. Because small pupil tends to be a little bit more complicated, it's considered as complex cataract extraction and has the CPT code of 66982. Uh, to use this code, it's really important that you document in your clinic note as well as in the uh, operative report that meiosis is a diagnosis. You want to make sure that you document the size of the pupil in your clinic note as well. As some of you may be aware, this year in 2013, there have been some reductions as far as the reimbursement of cataract surgery, and the complex cataract extraction is one of those types of cataract surgery that has seen a reduction in RVUs. Lastly, we want to talk about informing the patients. It's really important that you discuss with the patients the extra steps that's going to be involved when they have a small pupil. So just so they're aware that the surgery may be a little bit longer, it may require the use of extra instruments. The other issue to keep in mind is that sometimes when you're mechanically stretching the pupil, the pupil may not necessarily look the same after the surgery. So it's really important, again, that you inform the patient that their pupil may be permanently dilated after the surgery or it may have an abnormal appearance, just so they're not surprised about it after the surgery. Other issues to discuss with them is the risk of higher complications with a small pupil. Post-tests. Question number one. A small pupil can increase the risk of complications during the following steps of cataract surgery. Number A, capsulorexis. B, installation of intracameral anesthetic. C, phacal emulsification. D, corneal wound construction. E, both A and C. And F, all of the above. So the correct answer in this case would be E, both capsulorexis as well as phacal emulsification. The other uh, stages of cataract surgery where a small pupil will be affected include hydrodissection as well as inserting the lens. A small pupil can be caused by the following conditions. A, pseudoexfoliation syndrome. B, tamsulosin. C, surgery. D, diabetes. E, all the above. And the correct answer is E, all the above. The following are true regarding the small pupil. A, it is billed as a routine cataract extraction. B, IFIS is commonly associated with the use of tamsulosin. C, pupil stretching is a technique that should be used to manage IFIS. D, patients should be informed of the increased risk of complications with a small pupil. E, both B and D, and F, all the above. The correct answer would be E. Answer A is incorrect because, as I indicated, small pupil is considered as complex cataract extraction. C is incorrect because if you stretch a pupil in cases of IFIS, it's just going to exacerbate the floppiness of the pupil, and it's going to make the surgery more difficult. Thank you.